Thank you for joining us uh, for the news briefing on this Wednesday. We're going to go ahead and get started with the very big news about the reopening of Highway 1. We've got our colleagues from Caltrans with us, and we'd like to start with you, Kevin Verbinski. Thank you, Matt. Uh, we're happy to announce, the governor was able to announce yesterday, the uh, reopening to unrestricted public access to the Big Sur starting Friday at 6.30 in the morning, and that'll be uh, under a signal, a temporary signal, which will have alternating traffic, uh, the kind uh, for which people are, are accustomed to uh, seeing during uh, repair work on the Big Sur coast. Um, since the March 30th slip out, our goal was to stabilize and reinforce uh, the, the site there. And we were able to do that with some ambitious engineering and, uh, you know, just, yeah, it was a really, uh, in, in the in uh, several weeks, just to be able to say that we're under, uh, you know, signalized one way traffic and unrestricted twenty four seven access, is a uh, you know, uh, you know, it's a big team that pulled that off, and we're just excited to announce that. We certainly, you know, since March thirtieth, we didn't want that the rock slide that was happening under the roadway to advance across the highway and and perhaps damage the northbound lane. We were we were able to accomplish that. Um, I may not do this uh, literally, but next time I get up to Rocky Creek, I would like to uh, get out and kiss the northbound lane because um, it's doing yeoman's work here. Um, and and when it first closed, what we recognized almost immediately was uh, how state highways often serve as the main street for communities. I, I think about that in in Castroville. Uh, in Oceano, in other uh, Watsonville, the, the state highway can be someone's main street. And what we realized when we were just having the conversation about convoys and scheduling and that, and who might be involved in that, it was it was families. It was uh, families having to drop their kids off at school, um, people needing to get in and out to go to work, uh, essential services like waste management uh, needing to you know adjust their schedule. And it was a uh, incredible coordination with all of the public safety and emergency responders to really coordinate a plan for, given the situation that this crane was going to be astride the northbound lane uh, through day and nighttime shifts, uh, how were they going to arrange that response? Uh, I think about all, all the partners that made this happen. Um, certainly, state parks who not only provided a uh, you know law enforcement presence down there. But also was able to manage their their uh, reopening uh, in a way that didn't uh, invite you know hundreds more people down south of the of Rocky Creek, and that reduced the pressure on emergency response and and public safety folks. Um, we're proud of the fact that this ambitious repair work, where we were hanging a crane over the site of a you know 170 feet up in the air to do horizontal drilling, uh, was accomplished uh, safely. And, and we'd like to, you know, hopefully that is an inspiration for travelers who then access, you know, 24 uh, seven highway one to, to get in and out of Big Sur. Uh, as a reminder to, to travel safely, to be patient in, in waiting for the signal. Uh, it's really, you know, it comes back to us over and over this, this highway, how um, immensely beautiful it is. And we're going to lose sight of that if we're all out of patience and driving in a hurry. Let's soak it in and, and enjoy the uh, and enjoy the the getting there as much as the destination. Um, in the end, we were able to um, in you know drill, install, and grout forty vertical and seventy five uh, sub horizontal steel elements in there, which provided the reinforcement and stabilization for that southbound lane. Um, it. It really reinforces it in a way that that we're not we're not we're com have high confidence in the fact that that uh, there's not going to be any advancement of of the damage that was there. Um, it'll be continued to be monitored by visual inspection and by geotech monitoring, and um, we're uh, we're already been able to take advantage during this closure to do preliminary uh, drilling work and really important geotech work to identify locations in which we're going to drill the supports for the for the you know again this is still an emergency reopening to reopen this to two to two lanes of travel and so that that more permanent repair to two lanes is already underway and getting a huge push uh, the governor identified spring 25 of uh, 
spring of 2025 when when we expect uh, the completion of the that more permanent repair uh, to put it to two to two lanes. Um, travel travelers heading south through the Rocky Creek on Highway One will be able to travel as far as Lime Creek, which is just south of the Esalon Institute. Uh, there's a closure in place at that location due to three slides that we have in a row right there. We have the from the north to the south, we have Dolan Point, Regents, and then uh, Paul slide. And uh, uh, Dolan Point is wrapping up in the in the coming weeks. They, the only thing pending really is to have a, a drapery installed over the over the slope above the roadway. And that's a feature that you'll see on other locations of Highway 1 uh, to protect uh, from debris rolling down onto the roadway. So it's just it's just awaiting that uh, that uh, installation. Once that's installed at, at, at Dolan Point and Dolan Point is complete, that won't change the limit of Lime Creek being the, the limit. It's a it's a key area of a turnaround. It's it's uh, it's been constructed in a way that there's a, a good turnaround area. There's a good line of sight to it. And opening the road would just be a, a short hop down to the Regents slide, uh, and there aren't any real residences or businesses uh, within the the closure between Dolan Point and Regents, uh, so nobody will be inconvenienced. The next the next opening that'll happen is later this summer when Paul slides op it opens, and then Regents we're, we were able to start repair work on that on about April 30th, and there's a, there's a fall estimate for reopening there. For travelers approaching on Highway 1 from the Cambria San Simeon area, they'll be able to travel north uh, as far as Lime Kiln State Park. So essentially what that leaves is just, just about a 12-mile closure between Lime Creek at the north and Lime Kiln State Park to the south. Um, we, just again to recognize and thank all the partners that contributed to doing this, including the County of Monterey Office of Emergency Management, their communications arm, all our state partners, uh, our local elected officials who kept this uh, visible and uh, helped advance the repair. Um, um, I'm going to leave people out, but I don't want to. I don't want to go without thanking the CHP who were there on our convoys, staffing those, keeping the community informed. Really. At a, at a certain point, not verifying that the southbound traffic weren't getting through, but providing the education to the southbound traffic who were going through the afternoon convoys about the nature of the of the closure and that they wouldn't be able to return to the to until the morning. Um, their their presence, their the the safe way in which they operate, and the way they were able to help us communicate were incredible, and really uh, couldn't do it with, without them. Um, at this time, I'd like to. Uh, share this time with Zeke, who can provide additional analysis for us. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I believe this will be our last uh, press briefing at this point for this uh, stabilization effort that we've addressed. And we'll certainly be willing to, Maya, come back and talk about the future work that will be ongoing out there. Um, I think Kevin really captured, you know, the, the gist of the work uh, that has been done and the existing conditions out there. So I appreciate that, Kevin. Um, as he mentioned, there's a lot of um, partners and uh, appreciation that goes out, you know, not only to all of our um, local uh, state and even the federal folks that helped uh, weather service was fantastic they gave us uh, daily updates that we were able to really utilize to plan each work schedule um, uh, pg e was super helpful in doing the drop for the power supply for the temp signal and you know we had amazing contract forces uh, tiger construction is our prime contractor uh, drill tech was the primary subcontractor who did the really challenging drilling work as well as uh, Daryl Varney Electric uh, and getting everything done in a very timely manner. So uh, appreciate everybody's effort on that. Um, as far as work uh, that is ongoing this week, we have three more convoys. Um, so tonight, tomorrow morning, and then tomorrow PM, and then uh, on Friday AM will be open to traffic. So the ongoing work in the remaining time is you know, essentially the preparation for receiving traffic through this temporary signal, and that includes um, testing the signal system, making sure we get the timing correct, um, 
replacing the K-rail, uh, developing the tapers, doing the restriping work, and then obviously a lot of the cleanup and uh, pulling everything off site and getting that ready to reopen. I think that pretty much captures, um, you know, the ongoing work for the next couple of days. And Kevin kind of touched on the fact that we are actively moving forward with the bridge design work. So in the, um, in the upcoming weeks to probably a month, we'll be prepared to, you know, talk more about what that design ultimately looks like and how we'll uh, begin to implement that process. Happy to entertain any questions. Um, otherwise, you know, thank you everybody for uh, all the patience and uh, support as we got through this first phase here. Thank you both. Um, we've had lots of questions that you may that I think you both touched on in terms of the other repairs and the timing on the rest of them. I'm wondering if you could go through them again because we've got questions about Paul slide. Dolan point and then Regent slide. If you could run through the list that you, Kevin, that you gave. And then if you could talk a little bit about driver patience because the reverse signal has a certain time limit. So when people get to it, they can at least anticipate knowing, you know, how much time they're just really gonna have to wait for their turn and the signal. In terms of the closures, the Northern, uh, the one that's, you know, if you're headed South, the first one that you'll run into is Dolan Point. We expect that to that repair to be accomplished this month, and then uh, on the on the the most southern end, Paul Slide. We expect a summer uh, completion and and reopening of Highway One at Paul Slide, and then in the fall for Regent Slide. Uh, there uh, there will come a point when Regent Slide will be the the controlling slide, right? That uh, given the the at present the circumstances and conditions of the slides that it looks like regions would be the key to the full reopening so that we can drive from uh, you know Carmel to Cambria uh, without without having to stop. Um, and the and it, I think it's important to note on the signal timing um, that's only about a 1300 foot uh, distance between the the two signals um, and that they are timed to allow for a bicycle to pass uh, under those under the cycle of the the lights turning. So uh, we're, we're hoping that people can be patient and, uh, and understand that uh, uh, the, real, the real take home is that there's 24 seven access. And if there's a, if there's a, a stop uh, and, and there's a, a short pause before you can travel all the way through or come home, that just to be patient with that and soak in the beautiful sights in which you'll be sitting in your car. That's right. Any other questions for, or, or Zeke, do you have anything to add on that? No, no, Kevin captured that correctly. Um, the signal will have uh, what we call loops that activate the signal system. And then there's also a camera system associated with that. So, you know, when two cars uh, come up from either direction, whoever gets there first will then trigger the clearing phase and then they'll get the green light. And then there will be a set amount of time that the, the cars are allowed to traverse under the green. And then there will be a clearing time and then the other direction will be allowed to go. So just a little clarity on that, but no, Kevin captured it perfectly. And what we really do want to encourage everybody is to just be patient. Um, we have seen situations where we have temporary signals in place and people get impatient and then they, they decide to go when it's not their turn. And so we don't have like a head-on collision, but we do have that two, two people facing each other, trying to figure out how to get out of that situation. So that's always a challenge for us. So if we could push that message to just be patient and, and wait for the signal to work, we'll certainly be testing it and observing it and making sure that it's functioning um, properly and we'll make adjustments as necessary. But uh, to help us with that messaging would be very beneficial. And then another question, the governor signed an emergency proclamation. Can the $100 million that's available only be used for the slip out and not the other slides that are you're working on, such as Dolan Point Regents and Paul slide? I, I'm happy to take that, Kevin, if you want to. Um, the, the way we uh, receive reimbursement for these uh, is a function of if we have a disaster declaration or not. So the slides to the south 
are covered under a previous declaration and our funding will come through the Federal Highway Administration Emergency Response Program, the ER program. So um, we'll be capturing uh, reimbursement through that avenue. As far as the Rocky Creek side, we also had a declaration and our expectation is that we'll proceed or pursue reimbursement through that. So I don't anticipate Caltrans seeking reimbursement through that money that the governor uh, mentioned. I think that that'll be utilized more by the local counties impacted and we'll utilize the federal process that we have available for reimbursement. Thank you. Any other questions for Zeke or Kevin before we move on? I'm not seeing any. Uh, Thank you very much, both of you. We'd like to uh, have our CHP partner, Saul Perez, Officer Saul Perez from the CHP, tell us how the convoys have been going the last week and what I'm sure you're looking forward to getting back in the office, maybe. Did we lose hey. office? Yes, hello? Oh, there you are. Yes, Thank hello. Thanks for joining yeah. us. Yes, good afternoon. So hello, yeah, like I said met last time, my name is Saul Perez. I'm an officer with the California Highway Patrol. Again, I'd first like to say thank you for having me here and allowing me to address the community. Uh, thank you to all our allied agencies and personnel there on scene. Thank you, Kevin, for those kind of words. As many of us are here, we really are advocates to um, be assets to our community and to our, our county. Um, we really love what I do. And when we get information like that back from the community, it feels like we're in the, in the right step. Um, so information about the convoys. Um, so same thing has been continuing. Convoys are there. Um, there's two daily convoys through Highway 1 through the Rocky Creek slip out. And again, it's open to all members of the traveling public. The first convoy uh, will run at the beginning of 7 a.m. again. And the last convoy is at 5 p.m. Each convoy will run for approximately one hour. So the crews can also continue and so they can stay on, on schedule to open uh, the roadway. Um, as for the numbers, um, I mentioned last week that um, as of today, uh, two weeks ago, the numbers were approximately 500 uh, passing motorists going through the closure. Last week, it was uh, 700. And this week, it seems to be consistent at, at around 700 vehicles as well. Um, now, also last week, I got a few questions regarding um, which lane would go first and some other questions. Um, I followed up with the officers that were there on scene and seeing which way was the proper way to assess the situation and what they found more uh, resourceful in order to let traffic flow. So they they found that the most prominent way was to let the northbound and first so they can let all the people from there in the Big Sur area um, out of there and then they'll continue the, with the with the southbound traffic. Um, the last convoy again is scheduled for this Thursday afternoon. And after the last convoy, CHP will still remain on scene until the next day once the traffic light is activated and we're released from, from scene. Yeah, so, and I think it's a great thing for people to know that just be, the signal is open, but this is still a little bit new to people who are driving and you're, I'm hoping that you'll be there. And I'm sure Caltrans is hoping you'll be there to help with the etiquette of you know, when to go and getting everybody educated on how to use these reverse signals. Ab absolutely. So just because um, the the convoy is editing, our job is not done. Um, our, our, we're still going to be out there as an asset for the community to um, relay information and to provide the information needed to, to show that this is um, – Still, we need to be patient and be cautious as we're traveling through, keep an eye, um, high visual horizon, seeing the other vehicles, bicyclists, anything that may be going on in the area. Now, because this this is great news that we're going to be opening up soon, um, we do expect a higher amount of traffic, especially as it's going down Memorial Weekend. The beautiful days are coming out, so it's expected to have a higher amount of traffic going through that area. So with that being said, we also want to um, advise the, the traveling community to be patient. Um, keep your eyes up on the road. Do not be do not text and drive. Be be safe and um, be aware of your surroundings. And could you clarify the number you gave for for the convoys of 700? Is that per day or per week? 
Yeah, that's, that's still per day. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you, any questions for Officer Perez on the convoy information? Thank you, I, I see seeing, seeing none, but if we get some additional questions, I will forward them to you. Thank Absolutely, you for thank sharing. you so much. I sure appreciate you being here. And then last but certainly not least, we've got Rick Aldinger with the Big Sur Chamber of Commerce. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're probably one of the happiest people on earth today. <laughs> uh, no doubt. We, we got some really great news yesterday and, and uh, uh, certainly want to thank uh, Caltrans and their contractors for their, uh, you know, unrelenting focus on, on uh, getting the highway opened. Uh, I want to thank Kevin and Zeke for keeping all of us uh, updated. Uh, I think they did a great job of that on a mostly a daily basis, and it's much appreciated. And of course, to echo Kevin's uh, thanks to uh, our local, you know, law enforcement folks uh, and uh, health and safety, Big Sur Fire, and uh, all of the uh, our elected representatives that. Uh, again, just had a laser focus on this issue and, and making sure that uh, everything was done and expedited in a way that uh, uh, allowed the governor to make that great announcement yesterday. So much appreciated. Um, I was hoping you might fill us in on any, if you have any update on, I know people have been doing all they can to support the businesses and the employees who are down there and um, are you seeing any um, more results from the fundraiser that had happened last week in support of your of the employees down there, or and or are you just getting everybody kind of back in gear and ready to gear up for the weekend? So, um, yeah, you know, I I I, I do want to uh, just let everyone know that uh, you know the business levels are still depressed uh, with the, you know, the convoys uh, allowing the public through the convoys was uh, very helpful uh, and had uh, a, a small but uh, important uh, positive effect on the economy in Big Sur and getting people back to work. Uh, and uh, right now, you know, the, the local business leaders, uh, property managers and operators are scurrying of course, as you might expect, to uh, get uh, schedules filled out and, and uh, people called back in uh, to uh, get going on Friday. And it's, it's really good that we're going to have uh, a weekend or two to uh, kind of uh, do a dry run and, and get everybody back in the routine and a rhythm uh, before hitting the, the big holiday weekend. Uh, when, when I talked to folks uh, this morning, um, telephone uh, uh, telephone traffic is still a little bit light. And, and I know that uh, we, uh, uh, the, you know, the announcement is, is uh, only, you know, now 24, less than 24 hours old. And so we know it's going to take a little while to uh, get the public awareness of that and, and get things moving again. And uh, we, we realize too, that uh, when something, you don't know when something is going to happen, uh, uh, you have to wait for that announcement that, you uh, you know, our visitors, uh, they've made plans in a lot of cases. And uh, uh, so we, we know and realize it's going to be um, not like turning a light switch back on and everybody's going to be coming to Big Sur. It's going to be a process and, and uh, uh, it will take a little bit of time. But, uh, you know, we've made a, an important first step in doing that. Uh, so, there, you know, there is still a need. There, there are, you know, going to be people that aren't going to get their, their full hours back instantly. And uh, and so there is still a need for some relief there and, and uh, some support of those families and, and workers as as again, as we work our way through this process of rebounding and, and, and getting uh, the public back in. As of uh, this morning, uh, on the, the fundraiser that was held at the La Playa on May 7th, uh, as of this morning, through direct donations, ticket sales and the online auction, uh, we were at uh, just a little bit over $102,000. And, uh, uh, it, you know, I, I couldn't be happier to announce that number. That's a great number. And certainly want to thank uh, David Fink and all of the chefs who contributed uh, the La Playa Hotel, everyone who made that event happen and made it the success that it was. And uh, um, even though the event and the uh, um 
auction are over at this point. That link is uh, still open uh, and live uh, to donate, uh, make direct donations uh, through the Community Foundation. Oh, and again, to thank Dan and Christine at the Community Foundation for sure. And so that link is still live and uh, donations can continue to be made uh, again as we uh, uh, rebound and, and work our way toward normal business levels. Thank you. That, that's, just, that's just great news. It's just such great news. And I think we had a question in the chat that I that I think you answered talking about, are you ready for the onslaught? And I think <laughs> it's the onslaught that it, I think it's a delayed onslaught because so many people are now used to hearing about the closure that it does take time for this information to trickle out to get people to say, oh, I can go, you know, come to Big Sur again. And yeah, as, as I'm sure everyone on the call understands, you know, when something goes wrong in Big Sur, a highway closure, a bridge collapse, a, a major fire, uh, everyone in the world hears about it and they hear about it uh, multiple times every day for days on end. And uh, when the event is over, when the highway opens back up, it seems like, uh, just as you said, it's it's a bit of a trickle at first and, and uh, builds uh, over time. And uh, that that's a process and it, it can take uh, um, uh, it, it can take months uh, and, and maybe even a couple years in some cases for us to feel like we're back to normal. Uh, and, and again, uh, you know, we've, we've made the first important step in, in that process, though, uh, starting on Friday. And so we're looking forward to uh, making the most of it. Fantastic. Any other questions for Rick before we let him go and end our Big Sur topic? Seeing none, thank you so much for, for joining. And I really appreciate you coming these last couple of weeks. And also please thank Kurt Gappel for stepping in and sharing the information out of Big Sur. And I, I know we'll want to get back to you when recovery is in full swing and see how you're doing. Thank you very much, Maya. And, and uh, thanks for having us. Thank you. Uh, on to our next topic now. Additional support is coming to residents in Pajaro. A special workshop is coming on May 22nd. And we have our colleague, Mindy Escueda from the Department of Mer Emergency Services to tell us about this. Hi, Mindy. Hi, Maya. Thank you for, thank you for having us on. Yeah, we are very excited uh, to announce this upcoming workshop. I'll go ahead and uh, share the screen so you can see that. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that we were uh, very aware of is that there's uh, beyond the financial impact that, you know, thankfully we've been able to address, you know, with the recent uh, program of the individual assistance and the um, household assistance. Uh, we completed that uh, at the end of April. Um, we're uh, committed to basically just the full recovery of Pajaro in the community. And part of that, you know, is also the emotional and, and mental um, impacts that uh, those residents suffered during the floods um, of last year. So uh, we're going to have this uh, workshop held next week on uh, Wednesday on the 22nd in the evening from 6 to 8 p.m. It's going to be at the Assumption Church, and this is going to be specifically focused. It's an interactive, informative workshop. Uh, it's going to be conducted by the um, Center for Community Advocacy. They have a specific program. It's called Promotoras de um, Salud, so they are a group that focuses on mental health specifically. So they're bringing just a wealth of information and activities, hands-on activities, uh, to work with the residents to help relieve this. And we're just very excited to roll this out and to continue our workshops in helping the community. Thank you so much, Mindy, for, for sharing this. And so can you tell us a little bit more in terms of, is this an invitation that has just gone out to all the residents to, you know, come and feel free to really, you know, talk about where their life is at right now? Exactly. So one of the things that we were aware of uh, when we were doing the um, inf inform informative sessions announcing the program, you know, ahead of the um, individual assistance, the financial program, uh, one of the things that we were hearing at those info sessions is the need for this. And so we were very pleased that we had already had this in process and we were excited to announce it. A lot of the residents um, in any time that we've done any type of workshop in Pajaro, we're always hearing the same message that there is still very much trauma there. You know, 
a, a lot of the, the children were traumatized by the experience and the families as well. And so there is a lot of um, leftover, um, I would say, emotions and, and just mental health uh, that needs to be addressed. And so, yeah, we're very excited. Um, they're bringing, like I said, just a wealth of activities and just a lot of information that will be able to be useful even on the day to day beyond getting past this event that was very traumatizing, but just tools that they can use in their daily lives as well. Thank you very much, Mindy, for bringing this to our attention and letting us share this. Um, any questions for Mindy about the program, about this program? Seeing none, I, I'm glad you were able to drop in briefly to talk about this and we look forward to hearing about the results. Thank you, Maya. Uh, also, there's another fun event going on right now. The Department of Social Services has put together a kind of a parking lot resource fair. Uh, it's kind of on its last half hour, but we're very pleased to have Annette Gallegos from the Department of Social Services here to talk about this CalFresh benefit fair and a, an introduction of a new self-service center. Hi, Annette. Hi. Yes, so today uh, we are celebrating um, CalFresh Awareness Month for the month of May. And we do have an event here at our Life Foundation building in 1000 South Main Street. And we have a couple of community partners here with us um, sharing just information about the benefits that we provide, how to apply online. So we are also opening our uh, self-service center in our Life Foundation building to assist really our residents to learn how to uh, use our online services as well. So they can apply, they can check their case status, but also most, uh, not, I'm not gonna say most important, but one of the important things that we wanna share is also that there is a lot of skimming that occurs in our CalFresh and, and uh, CalWorks programs. And so um, the state did initiate a, uh, a created and launched uh, an application and it's called EBT Edge. So we're also um, showing our uh, customers and our residents how to use that to avoid the skimming, help avoid, I'm going to say, the skimming. Um, in addition to that, new EBT cards that are chipped will be coming this summer. So we want to share that information with everybody and hope people can come by. Um, by one, we are about 30 minutes away to close, but we have had some individuals. In addition to that, I'm going to share that we also have a um, outreach van that we will be um, launching at the end of this year. It'll be wrapped and we'll have an interview room. So we do hope to be going out to our um, community where we don't have an office. An example would be, we would be able to go to Pajaro to actually do outreach um, or down South to San Ardo um, or in any other town where we don't have um, an office to hopefully do outreach because we know we have county residents that do not have benefits and they are eligible. So we definitely want people to come and learn about our programs. Annette, thank, first of all, thank you so much for just doing this from the parking lot right there. I just so appreciate it. Um, the skimming is a is really a thing, and there are a lot of people who've been victimized, you know, with credit cards. But when you have an EBT card, when somebody steals from you, you're stealing food. You know, they're stealing food right out of your mouth. And so, if you could talk a little bit more about what that education is to help these recipients protect those benefits. So there, it is uh, to me one of the saddest things because it is our vulnerable families. <laughs> um, so what we have is really the EBT edge where they can freeze their benefits. So we want to teach them how to use the application and protect those benefits until they're ready to use them because we have had many customers who come in and um, all of their benefits for the month are gone. And we do replace them for uh, that month, but it'll, it has continued to happen to several families uh, for a few months um, in the year. And so we really want to try to, avoid that because we're not able to always replace all the benefits that are um, lost. Thank you. So for, for residents who may not be able to get down to your parking lot fair today, should they go online and try to make an appointment? How should they reach out to you if they'd like to get more education about the EDGE program? So they can um, come, they can come in really definite to our self-service center so we can um, give them information and we, um, are posting our uh, EBT Edge information on our uh, DSS website as well. And they can call really our customer service center 
And our customer service center, um, sorry, is 877-410-8823. And we want them uh, to ask as many questions as possible uh, that they may need. They will tell them how they can apply because they don't have to come to the office. They can do it online. They can do it by phone. They can do it by mail. They can fax it in. Um, and then they can learn about the EBT Edge as well. And we will send them that information actually in a text. So we have a, an application for text. And so we can send that information to them as well to their cell phone. Thank you. That is just great. Uh, are there any questions for Annette before we let her go back and do her other work or do her other job at the fair? Uh, not, no more questions for you. Annette, thanks so much for, for dropping in and sharing this about this great event. I sure appreciate it. Thank you. And now we're going to come, we're going to bring ourselves back uh, into the office. We have, there are two more fun events happening this weekend, and they are showcasing our really amazing public works department and staff and their accomplishments. We're very pleased to have our chief of public works, Enrique Saavedra here to talk about not only kind of what's coming up with these events, but there are a lot of accomplishments that this department does that we take for granted because we just see that things get done and we don't realize how much work goes into that. Hi, Enrique. Thanks very much for being here. Hi. hi. Hello, everybody. And Maya, thank you for getting the opportunity to talk to the group here about public works and what we do. Um, and I'm also here to kind of highlight the fact that next week is a National Public Works Week. So this is uh, where we, across the country and probably across the world, celebrate the many things that happens in public works sector. Um, and just to talk a little bit about that, because sometimes um, we may take this for granted. Um, um, there's things that that we we use, we rely on to be in there for us, but you know, it takes a lot of work to to, to make sure they're functioning reliably all the time. And these are things like our roads. Uh, we just heard from Caltrans, for example, that um, you know they they are responsible for making the roads. So and we as a community rely on roads to be open and free and to use by everybody. But when they're missing, when they're not functioning properly, it hurts our community. So um, that's one thing. The other thing is um, our water systems, our, our potable water systems, our sewer systems. We we uh, you know come to custom that when we turn the tab, water should come out. Um, same thing. We flush our toilet, the water should go down. And uh, these things, you know, these are systems that are very complicated. And widespread, and we are constantly relying on these systems to be there for us when we need them. Um, and there's a, it takes a team, a whole teams of, of people throughout the country to make sure these systems are working properly. So next week um, we celebrate this, and to help us celebrate or, or make you know, raise awareness about the work that happens in the public works, uh, we're gonna have some events coming up. And if I could just share my screen, mine just to a little bit here, I'll put a flyer here uh, that that we put together. Uh, for the upcoming events this weekend. So um, on uh, Saturday the 18th, we're gonna be down in the uh, King City area at San Rosa Park. And there we'll have some equipment, some of our staff will be there um, talking about what we do um, and the different, you know, to kind of show them the, how the work gets done. We'll also be providing some um, things for the kids to, uh, to do and, so they can interact with our equipment and, and see those different, you know, big uh, piece of equipment that we operate. So that'd be fun for the kids. We'll also have opportunity for uh, uh, college kids, teenagers to ask about what we do and, and you know, in case they're interested in a profession in, in public works. Um, and then we'll also have opportunity to uh, provide interest card for people who may want to apply for a job at, in the public works arena. So again, it's King City on Saturday and they're going to report repeat that event one more time on Sunday um, in Salinas here behind Northridge Mall at by the Hobby Lobby parking lot. Uh, the events are 11 to two, um, both days. And um, you know, one neat thing that we're doing now is uh, we use drones uh, to take uh, measurements and, and, and assessments of our systems. So we'll have a drone uh, out there and we'll have a drone operator to in case the kids want to see how that gets done. So we have a lot of neat things out there for all ages. And again, it's just to highlight the, the important work that takes place in the public work sector. Um, and then uh, just to jump to next week, um, we'll be at the Board of Supervisors on Tuesday morning to receive our, our resolution acknowledging the, the efforts and the great work that's done by public works departments here in Monterey County. So um, again, just wanted to bring that everybody's attention to, to next week. It's a 
very important for we uh, for us here at Public Works. So uh, I'm happy to um, be talking about it and answer any questions that may be from the group. You know this this outreach that you're doing this, these fun fairs. I mean, I, I had two sons, so there's just there's no way I could have gotten away from uh, seeing trucks in the parking lot and you know all the kids just coming and really enjoying the equipment. But you're also looking for the public work staff of tomorrow, where kids can say, "I could grow up to drive that truck," I, and it would be a good job for me. So it's not just play, but you know, here you are, a chief of public works. You know, you may have played with a few trucks when you were little too, and here you are. Yeah, no, it's a great point. Uh, that's another reason for having these outreaches is that we really in a need of, of um, having labor there available for us to do to, to fill these these important roles in, in these maintaining our system. So, um, and that starts with getting the the little kids uh, uh, at least make them aware of what the work that takes place and how they can choose a career to be a, a, a operator of one of these pieces of equipment, to be a surveyor. To be an engineer, uh, whether it be a civil engineer, a mechanical engineer, a structure engineer, a geotechnical engineer, um, there's a lot of again a lot of professions that, that are, are needed to uh, make sure our systems are adequately working. Um, so that's another point of this is just to get hopefully spark an interest in kids, um, at least here locally too, um, in, in in getting a career, looking for a career in in public works. Um, I'm fortunate enough that I I'm from Salinas, I grew up in Salinas. And I said in Selena, so I'm very happy about that. Um, and so, again, we just want to kind of prepare our next generation of, of, of kids that will be replacing us at some point in time and uh, continue that 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 um, ability to maintain our, our different infrastructure systems. Fantastic. And then if anyone who has parents of young children, especially, you know, I, little boys, boy, this will be a fantastic outing, you know, a great, uh, you know, early, late morning, early afternoon event to come mm -hmm. and see the drones, look at the equipment and, you know, think about their, think about their future. They don't have to think about it right now, but, you know, op open the door for those, for those next generation of workers. Thank you, Enrique, very much for coming, stopping by and talking about it. We hope you have a great turnout for the event. Okay. Look, thank you and look forward to seeing uh, folks out there. Great. Uh, and then we're going to wrap up our briefing today with a really great thing, a, a really thing, a, something to celebrate. The Community Action Partnership is marking an, an incredible 60th anniversary, 60 years of service. And if you don't know about the Community Action Partnership, we're going to talk about that and make and educate you because this is a fantastic um, grouping of agencies that really work with uh, communities in need. And we're very pleased to have Jake Adello with the Community Action Partnership here to talk about this, along with Adriana Nerez Tapia, also with our Department of Social Services. Welcome to the news briefing. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Before I do have here um, our public officer as well, I brought him in, joined him in John Gill. So I'll go ahead and let him introduce. He's our, our PIO here for our Department of Social Services. Hello. Thank you so much, Maya and, and uh, the rest. Um, as you heard, my name is John Gill. I am newly appointed Community Action Partnership Director, as well as the County Monterey Department of Social Services Public Information Officer. And just a privilege to be able to be here and serve the community, but more important than that, we're here to celebrate the 60 years of community action. Uh, for 60 years, the nation's community action network has inspired a spirit of hope, has helped millions of people each and every year change their lives and improve communities all across America. The community action vision remains clear. We, we believe in a nation that creates opportunities for all people to thrive, build strong, resilient communities, and ensures a more equitable society. Overall, as a vision, America's Community Action is to connect millions of children and families to greater opportunities, transforming their lives and making communities in our nation stronger. Uh, so I'm excited, like I said, just to see and hear and, and be a participant of these great uh, opportunities that we have to make an impact in the community. And uh, definitely want to hand it over back to Adriana, our Community Action Partnership Management Analyst. We'll talk a little bit more about the success that Community Action has had the past 60 years. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John. So I know that now, especially economy, and or in the last uh, years, they've been really hard. And our the population that is affected is the population that are experiencing poverty and experiencing maybe they're just one missed check and they're away from hardship. 
So uh, the whether our Monterey County residents are experiencing a temporary setback or have been priced out of affordable housing, uh, too many struggle to achieve a good quality of life. And therefore we do have about one, a thousand or more community action agencies nationwide reaching out to families and children in about 99% of America's, count, America's counties. Here at Monterey County Community Action Partnership, we firmly believe that every individual should have the opportunity to provide uh, to their families and strive for success, regardless of their background or circumstances. Uh, Monterey County Community Action Partnership receives funding from the Community Service Block Grants, Domestic Violence Trust Funds, Homeless Funds, and the County of uh, Department of Social Services. So we work together and create this funding where we then create a network where we send it off to agencies, nonprofits, that they're able to provide the services out there. So let me go ahead and just bring in on Jake and, and uh, maybe he could go ahead and introduce and give some of our agencies that we currently are networking with. Thank you, Adriana, and I appreciate everybody being here today. Um, it is a great pleasure to serve Community Action. I serve as the chair of the Community Action Commission. I represent District 5 and was appointed uh, by Supervisor Mary Adams. Yesterday, we had the ability to be recognized at the Board of Supervisors with a resolution that recognized community action for their 60 years of existence um, and all of the hard work that we have put in so far. Um, that network that we <clears throat> that we provide to the low-income population of Monterey County, we work with nine different agencies um, to provide uh, need. Our commission and the Community Action Partnership Provide, does a um, community needs assessment, and we identify specific needs um, for our low-income populations right here in Monterey County, and ultimately, we then go out and we fund programs with nine different agencies, or we, we, we try to fund as much as we can, nine different agencies, um, and they are meeting those specific needs that came out of um, the assessment that we conducted. So I want to recognize those agencies because we cannot do our work without them. That is the Community Homeless Solutions, uh, the Boys and Girls Clubs of Monterey County, Gathering for Women, Goodwill Central Coast, uh, Meals on Wheels of the Monterey Peninsula, Partnership for Children, Sun Street Centers, United Way of Monterey County and YWCA of Monterey County. And like I said, with along with the fantastic staff, uh, the CAP staff, and this network of agencies and the um, community service block grant funding that we receive and we dole out, um, we, are we are doing the very best that we can to be meeting the needs of the low-income population right here in Monterey County. And we're just a small part of a very larger network um, in, that is countrywide, and it's been going on since the 60s. So we're very proud to be part of that network, and we're very proud of the work that we're doing right here at home in Monterey County. Thank you very much. Jake, thank you so much, and uh, Adriana and John also for bringing this to our attention. I think a lot of people think all this stuff happens just magically, and it doesn't happen magically. It's the hard work of the commission and the partnership and getting all these organizations engaged and together and serving residents. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the needs assessment, because you really hone in on the re results of that assessment to drive the funding for the agencies that are going to help people in need and, and resolve those unmet needs. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I'll go ahead and step in. So the needs assessment, we focus on domains from uh, the federal state sends out certain domains and they said this is basically what domains means that we have for example, transportation is one of the domains that was recently added. There's health, there's food, there's employment. So what we do is we try to build our community needs assessment. It's more of a survey where we reach out to the community and we ask, what are the community needs based on those domains? We incorporate questions in our survey to cover all those domains. Out of those domains, then we have an idea of what is the, uh, the, the population here in Monterey County need. What are they needing? Are they needing childcare? Are they needing transportation? Are they needing gas money? Are they needing assistance with food, health, prepped meals? What are they needing? One of the things that we report is 
we also we do like a check and balance on the nonprofit. So basically, what we do is we get uh, we get a, a profit. We get a, a, a nonprofit saying, "Okay, Adriana, I will go ahead and provide transportation services," and we give them how much will you be able to assist in the community with the amount you'll receive. So then that way we report back to the federal, and that way we have a check and balance between is are the dollars that are coming into the Monterey County being helpful, and are the are the needs being met. So we do have a cap plan where we incorporate our findings, our results from our reporting, and as well as controlling, making sure that that funding is spent in areas that the community needs. That's why we encourage a lot of the community to take part of this survey because that's the only way we could provide those services. There's no other way that we can say, or John or Jake here, or we're going to distribute on this area if we don't have enough backup data to send to the federal, to the state, and saying this is our need in Monterey County. So greatly encourage the population, uh, constituents, agencies out there to take the survey. We're going to be creating the survey. We're in the process of doing it. The survey will come in January. So we're hoping before that, that by, by in 2025, January, we'll start the survey and we'll start collecting the data for the residents here in our, in our Monterey area. So hopefully we're reaching the South County, all of the areas here in Monterey. So we, we also probably will need from, uh, from the media, from the community out there so that our community needs assessment get out there. And thank you for bringing that up because I know that we've promoted the survey in the past, but I think what you're saying, it really highlights the importance. It's not just a survey. This isn't just about, you know, when do I want to go shopping or, you know, what, how late do I want a store open? This is really about if I'm someone who has a need or I'm having difficulty, you know, in my life, this survey will help you know what it will help me live a better life or improve my life. Yes, thank you, Maya. That is correct. It's not a survey of exactly of how do you rate the program from one to 10. This is more of what are your needs. And I've been out there in the community. You'll see me. Sometimes I was at the hairdresser with my doing my hair and I saw a line of individuals at a food bank. I said, this is population in need. I'm going to reach out and take the survey. I build them. I explain the history. Why is it the need? It's not because if this is our duties, we just don't send a letter and say, hey, Monterey County, this needs this survey. We actually ask and we have data to prove that that is what the community actually does need. So, yeah, that is basically a little bit of the background of the needs assessment. It's more of a not a survey. We call it a survey. That's how we collect the data, our method of doing it. But we're planning on doing some uh, different uh, d different idea this year. So we definitely will be coming back and uh, promoting it here, <laughs> Maya. And I know you, your partner agencies that that you that receive the funding that you get. The part of that that survey helps you know how much they need to do the services because you you have a really broad range of partners, and so it sounds like they're trying to meet a wide variety of needs for uh, of people who live all over the county. That is correct. Yes, we encourage our service. Our services that we currently provide are youth education and recreation. So mental health support, uh, food access and meals, uh, domestic violence prevention uh, and intervention, homeless housing and homeless and housing services, life skills training for parents and employment and financial education, information and referral services. So those are our services that we focus on and we reach out on agencies, not profits that focus on those areas to spread and make sure that we're covering the majority of our needs. So those, are, but those needs do do come from the needs assessment, and those are really great partnerships. The all the, I mean, there are many wonderful agencies around the county, but the ones that you have in your stable for services are just really dedicated and fantastic organizations that really make a difference in people's in people's lives. Thank you, May. It breaks my heart sometimes when I don't have enough funding to cover more areas or to cover more services, more nonprofits and agencies bidding for the money and not having that that funding available. So we do try to collect from the domestic violence fund, we try to from the, the homeless fund, from uh, whatever social services is also uh, able to provide. But the majority of our community action partnership does uh, oversee the community, uh, the, the block grant from from the state that we do get, but unfortunately sometimes that's limited, but uh, we wish and we keep on fighting to struggle and see the needs in the County of Monterey so that way we could get eventually more funding. 
And thank you so much for kind of taking all these questions and sharing it. We look forward to promoting the survey in January and um, hearing more about your successes in the next, you know, in the months to come. I sure appreciate you being here. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everyone. And thanks everyone for joining us on the news briefing this week. Our next briefing is next week and we'll see you then.